With me now, our friend and white collar crime expert, Seth Baronswag. He's a managing partner at Baronswag Leonard and frequent guest here on In Business. And, and Seth, were you surprised to see that John Corzine delivered this testimony and has agreed to take questions? I am surprised. I think this will be a real minefield for him today. Uh, but I still think that there's an open question about him perhaps taking the Fifth Amendment right on some questions. He's going to be really walking through some really serious questions. Can you do that, pick and choose? You can. It depends what the level of the question is. As long as you uh, provide certain testimony, but when it gets to a certain level or a type of issues, you can preserve your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. So right now it looks like he's not going to do that. He doesn't want to do that, but there's a huge minefield out there because he probably recognizes that there is going to be a criminal investigation going on at the Justice Department just a few blocks down the road. Uh, a federal prosecutor will probably be appointed to consider impaneling a grand jury. So he doesn't want to, but he may have to. We'll have to see how it develops. Now, what can we expect him to sort of bob and weave on having read this written testimony. Right. Well, his his advanced remarks are fascinating, and I think what he's going to probably say this afternoon is, look, uh, I'm the CEO. I rely on certain people. That happens in corporations all the time. I didn't know exactly what the uh, what the uh, rules were with respect to segregation of funds. I didn't sit there every day looking through the balance sheets. I can't do that. I'm the CEO. The problem with that is that at the end of the day, the buck stops with you. The CEO is responsible for lifting up the hood and understanding in a most basic sense. What's going on in my company? Are these client funds being segregated? He has a fiduciary obligation to the shareholders, to the investors. Uh, and when he didn't do that, and when he admits in his prepared testimony that he didn't even know until the morning of the bankruptcy that these things were going on, that is a real serious problem. for The commingling so, of the accounts. The commingling of the accounts. So he will try to take a high level approach and say that he's at a 30,000 foot level and it's not really his responsibility. But the bottom line is that I think that he'll get slammed on that because of the end of the day, it is. Uh, former SEC Commissioner Harvey Pitt has been with us this morning, and when we were chatting, it, he said, you know, the, the language reads in this very complicated way, but where he's from in Brooklyn, it's called fraud. Right. Is that your understanding? <laughs> Absolutely. You're looking at misappropriation. You're looking at fraud. I think the Justice Department Criminal Division will be looking at uh, mail fraud and wire fraud, for example. So I completely agree with that. When you talk about misappropriation of funds, you're talking about mishandling other people's money. And the CEO, at the end of the day, is responsible for that. So I agree with that, and I predict that the Justice Department will appoint a prosecutor to uh, look at a grand jury because there are felonies. Uh, now, beyond the blame and figuring out what happened, it's right. what happens next for those who lost their money and are trying to get it back. Sure. What legal options are there? Unfortunately, for the stakeholders, those options are fairly limited. In a bankruptcy court, in a situation like this, the uh, individuals that have lost funds or frozen funds have to file what's called a proof of claim with the clerk's office. And then they basically stand in line. It's a very frustrating and frozen process. The U.S. trustee is going to go in there and try to find out the answer to the question that nobody, apparently including the former CEO, knows the answer to, which is, where did the roughly billion dollars go? So unfortunately, in the bankruptcy proceeding, these stakeholders are going to have to file their proof of claim wait in line, and it'll be a very frustrating wait for them. They have very limited options right now. And we do know from some of the testimony that uh, a lawyer for the trustee has said that there is no assurance, none, of 100 percent return of assets to those who lost their money. Right. And what happens in a bankruptcy proceeding is exactly that. It is uh, extremely rare, if not uh, almost non-existent, for a 100 percent return for the creditors of the company. And there are certain legal priorities that come up in line, but at the end of the day, but these the aren't people even credit, don't these get are it. people who, uh, you know, as you've heard from some of these congressmen, That's hey, right. I've got people in Illinois, in Iowa, in Vermont who are hedging their crops, they're right. farmers, and they want their money back. These exactly. weren't creditors in, in the traditional sense. So are there clawback options? I mean, can we expect to see really a way to find money to make them whole? In most instances, no. And that's really one of the more unique and historic aspects of this bankruptcy. It's one of the top 10 largest corporate bankruptcies in U.S. history. Uh, it extends well beyond Wall Street and through the farm belt. A lot of these individuals are not going to have those sophisticated, high-level, uh, extra secure transactional documents to get them in front of the line. And if you're a general unsecured creditor, then you have to wait in the back of the line. Okay. Thank you very much, Seth, for giving us that legal perspective.